uh, morning. So I am excited to introduce Dr. Alex Bond for this second plenary of today. Um, Alex has um, a number of things to talk about today, but he is currently curator of birds at the Natural History Museum, as well as being adjunct uh, researcher at University of Tasmania. And he mo mostly works on um, seabird and island conservation, um, particularly plastics and other contaminants. But he's also been uh, co-chair of the LGBTQ STEM group for seven years now, I think, um, which is an organization which promotes um, LGBTQ plus um, researchers, workers, and students in STEM subjects. And he's also been awarded the Royal Society Athena Prize for his work in um, improving and advancing diversity in this field. So today he's going to talk to us about seabird science, but also queerness um, and compassion in science and how being your authentic self is really important for um, creating good science in collaborations. So. Brilliant. Good morning, everyone. Hey, well done. It's, it's nine o'clock. This will be an interactive session, I warn you. Um, so as Olivia said, my name's Alex Bond. My pronouns are he and him. I'm at the Natural History Museum, um, and I also dab in a couple of other organizations, uh, which you'll see up there. Um, and I'd like to start my talk um, with a couple of disclaimers. Um, some of the content that I'll be talking about will be upsetting, and that's in both a, a conservation and diversity context. Uh, I have been and I will continue to be and I hope I continue to be wrong. Um, I would love nothing more than for someone to go back to some of the papers I wrote in the past uh, and come up with a better idea. And I think um, uh, some of that applies to when we talk about diversity in STEM as well. Uh, much like Avril mentioned yesterday, I want you to consider the source who's talking to you today. So I am an able-bodied, cis-white, middle-career male with a penchant for storm petrels and English as a first language. Um, I do not represent the diversity of uh, researchers, of people, uh, people in this room even. So um, just bear that in mind. Um, and just lastly, uh, penguins are, of course, as we all know, a bit overrated. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Um, I start my talks with the acknowledgments because um, often we put these at the end, but this is the science and, and the people, uh, this is the people that make the science that we do possible. So I think it's important to, to not shove them at the end like credits on a movie. Um, and uh, in particular, I want to thank, um, thank Mark and the organizing committee here for inviting me to give what I think will be a, a slightly different talk than we might be used to. So where do we start? Well, actually, I, I, I say 2009, but for me, my journey in terms of plastic started actually in 2006 at a Seabird Group meeting, uh, the meeting in Aberdeen, and a talk by Anne van Franeker on monitoring plastics in fulmars in the North Sea. And that, for me, sort of tweaked some switch. Um, and then a few years later, I was on a Qantas flight in 2009 going to Lord Howe Island in Australia. That's the airport in the background. That's the little Dash 8 that they get on from Sydney. It's about a two-hour flight. <clears throat> it's quite expensive. And because it's quite expensive back then, you got a free meal. Imagine that these days. And quite a substantial meal, I will point out. But if we look at what was provided in that meal, we have a plastic wrapped sandwich wrapped in plastic. We have a plastic wrapped chocolate bar, plastic cutlery wrapped in plastic, a plastic drinking bottle, and a plastic separate bottle of water all wrapped in a plastic clamshell package. That's a lot of plastic. And being the scientists that we were, when the uh, flight crew came around to take away all of our rubbish, we didn't give it to them. Uh, we took it to the research station, and we weighed it. It was 55 and a half grams. That's more than a storm petrol. And we can do a few quick, simple extrapolations and calculations. It's a Dash 8. There's about 40 people on the flight. At the time, there were nine flights a week. Uh, I'll let you do the calculations, show your workings. 
just over two tons every year. That's on this one flight. And this is plastics designed literally to be used once and then thrown away and never used again. So why do we have plastics? The long and the short of it is we have plastics so that we stop shooting elephants. Um, in the late 19th century, people used elephant ivory for billiard balls, pool balls. And they wanted to come up with a slightly cheaper, not sustainable, cheaper, and more readily available alternative. Um, so they came up with, uh, there was a competition, actually, and they came up with Bakelite, which was a phenol formaldehyde polymer uh, just over 100 years ago. And now plastics comprise any number of polymeric compounds. You've got acrylics, polyesters, silicones, polyurethanes, halogenated, the list goes on and on. And so if you look on the bottom of your drink bottle, or any bit of plastic that you think, I'm gonna put that in the recycling bin, there will be a number, a little sort of green triangle arrow recycling symbol. That tells you what sort of polymer it is. So the most common ones are two, high density polyethylene, one is PET, that's what your plastic drinks bottles are, are made of. Um, polypropylene, things like rope. Um, but then you've got this number seven, which you hardly ever see, because that's just the misc, the others, the bits that, oh yeah, there's, there's that as well. And some of it, I mean, obviously, you're not going to stamp cling film. But stuff like polyamides and toothbrush bristles, acrylonitrile, butadiene, styrene, that's what... Um, that's what this, that computer monitor is made from. So when we talk about plastics, we're talking actually about a diverse suite of polymeric compounds and the chemicals that are associated with them. And the thing about plastics is they don't actually break down. People say, oh yeah, plastic, they just break down in the environment. No, 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 they break up into ever smaller and smaller pieces. More than 90% of plastics that have ever been produced in the history of humanity still exist somewhere in the world today. Those that don't were incinerated, and those chemicals are circulating in the atmosphere. And each on their own, you know, probably isn't fatal. I will go on the record as saying I'm quite confident that every one of you has plastic inside of you right now. Um, it's not doing you any good, though, and they'll still hurt at some point. And the same applies to birds. Now, we've known this is a, an issue in seabirds for more than 60 years. The first paper on plastics in seabirds was written by Carl Kenyon and Jean Cridler from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They went out to, Laysan, uh, to Midway Atoll to work on Laysan albatrosses, and they came across pictures like this, which is the rib cage of a dead albatross chick from 1966. And you can see little bits of hard fragments and, and plastics inside. And at the time, they noted that about 75% of the albatross chicks had plastic in them. And today, we see that basically it's 100%. And the really interesting thing was that, you know, Carl Kenyon died in 2009. And in his obituary in the Ark, um, it mentioned that he was survived by his companion of 39 years, uh, Clarence Larson. Uh, which for me, as somebody who is gay and queer, that was something that just, we talked about you know, visibility and representation yesterday. I had no idea. This paper that I had revered for you know, the last number of years, ever since Jan's talk. Um, yeah, so that's something <clears throat> that I wish I had known back then. So I'll take you now to some of the work that we've been doing um, in the Adrift Lab. This is Lord Howe Island, a UNESCO World Heritage Site about halfway between Australia and New Zealand. Um, absolutely marvelous place, and the world's largest colony for flesh-footed shearwater. And we go out every year, sort of April, May, when the chicks are about to fledge, uh, and essentially we make shearwaters vomit bottle caps. So how did we come to be doing this with our lives? Well, for us, it sort of started in about 2011, um, and with Jen Lavers, who's a longtime friend and collaborator, we were for another project looking at trace element concentrations in feathers. And we noticed that uh, the birds from Lord Howe had you know, 
relatively high mercury compared to some of the other colonies. Um, the birds from WA had, uh, had reasonably high cadmium. We thought, well, that's quite interesting. And at the time, we'd known that the birds had a reasonable amount of plastic in them. We hadn't done any direct investigations for a while. And we hypothesized that some of this could be the metals uh, that are associated with plastics, the colorants, and the additives. That was sort of the, the theoretical idea, the whole start of the thing. Then in 2014, we decided to actually look at what the effects of these plastics were. So um, the plots here you can see on the left is massive ingested plastics uh, and the number of pieces. And we've got three standard measures of bird size. We've got body mass, wing cord, and head build. And these are all 90-day-old chicks. And we can see, and this holds true even if you get rid of those outliers, that birds with more plastic are in poorer condition. And because they're chicks of about the same age, they've obviously grown at a slower rate. And we can look at the plastics that they have inside them, and we can do some calculations about effect levels, bioaccessible concentrations for some of these polymers, and we can figure out, calculate what that final column is, which is the mass of plastic required uh, to reach that lowest adverse effects level. And for some of them, like cadmium, you know, it's 0. 0.0006 grams of plastic. Um, and so for some of the birds, they were reaching that orders of magnitude higher in a single feeding. So then we had a bit of an interregnum. Um, for five years, uh, one or both of us were in precarious employment. So, for example, in Australia, more than 50% of university courses are taught by precariously employed staff. Uh, it's about the same uh, in the UK. And that sort of contract disproportionately affects uh, women, non-white, non-straight, um, and, uh, and indigenous staff. We had a couple of international and interstate moves and a couple of non-research contracts. So if you look at a, a research career, we often, you know, we, Avril mentioned this again yesterday, um, in the context of maternity leave, you often think of it as this wonderful flowing river of publications, one streaming after another, when in fact um, there can be some quite large uh, some quite large gaps for a variety of reasons. So I thought it was just important to mention that. Um, then 2009, with, with, uh, with Georgi Stivitakis, who is an honor student with us, we decided to look at the very, very, very small. So we dissected out about 40 gizzards. The plastic's in the shearwaters. Most of it's in the proventriculus, which is the big stomach. Um, and there's smaller bits uh, in the more muscular gizzard. And we were counting them based on visual observation down to about uh, one or two millimeters. We thought, what are we actually missing here? You know, we've got this gizzard. That's the, the bit that grinds up the indigestible matter, the squid beaks, the fish eye lenses, the feathers, um, in some cases, grit. Um, and what Georgie found was that uh, we had you know, about more than half the plastics were in that sort of one to five millimeter range. Um, and about 4% were in that very, very tiny range, down to about one micron. Um, and by mass, they don't contribute a lot. You know, that makes sense. Um, but the thing about plastics is, of course, it's, it's surface area, because that's what's interacting with the bird. That's what's interacting with the ocean. It can act as a little toxic sponge that absorbs the hydrophobic contaminants from the water and might deposit them in the bird. So the smaller your object, um, the greater the surface area relative to volume. And then we went into the, even the littler, smaller, um, and looked at the physiological side of things. So for a number of years, um, the way that you looked at plastics was basically, there's a dead bird, let's cut it open and see what's inside. Now, being dead is a terrible indicator of how healthy you are. If someone says, how are you, and your two options are alive and dead, it doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. Um, there's some in this audience who probably don't feel so great, possibly after a very enjoyable night out. Um, you're not dead. I hope not. Um, and for birds, it's exactly the same. So when we think about what we were sampling for plastics, it was mostly these, these dead birds. So we started to investigate these sublethal effects. Um, 
And just the presence of plastic, those top six graphs, just the presence of plastic was enough to reduce circulating calcium in the bloodstream, important for bone growth. Again, these are 90-day-old chicks. Higher cholesterol, lower mass, lower wing cord, shorter culmen, shorter head bill, as we found a few years before. But also increases in things like uric acid, amylase, um, and, uh, and the decrease in, in calcium related to the amount of plastics in the bird. And that uric acid and amylase, those are related to kidney function. And so our hypothesis is, and we have no idea what the reference values are. We, we, we did measure, as you can see, a bunch of birds with no plastic in them. There's a lot of variance there. It's quite difficult to get ethics approval to give plastics to shearwaters for extended periods of time. So we're relying on this natural variation to sort of test these hypotheses. And the key thing here is that it's the individual responses that we were interested in, rather than a population level um, effect, because that's the level at which plastics and a lot of contaminants are actually operating. And then more recently, we've been thinking about, well, how the heck do we monitor plastics? There's a couple of really good examples of monitoring plastics in the world, Fulmars in the North Sea is one that many will be familiar with. It's the one that Jan gave a talk about um, 16 years ago now. Um, and we decided, well, let's look at boluses. So shearwaters and some of the um, other tube noses will regurgitate pellets on, on fledging. Not everyone, and you can't necessarily tie it to an individual bird or burrow, but you can walk around the colony and you can pick these up off the floor. Relatively low effort, walk around, see a bolus, pick it up. Um, and what we found was that the contents of these boluses were relatively similar in terms of the types of plastic, the colors, um, and, and the mass to what we were seeing in birds that we lavaged. So birds where we pump their stomach, which is how we get most of our, most of our data. And you can chuck that variance over a number of years into a power analysis, and you can see, brilliant, we can get, you know, if you're only collecting a few, you can't really detect a huge change. So the number of birds required on the y-axis versus the percent change you can detect on the x. But relatively quickly, you can get down to, you know, reasonable numbers. And in terms of variation we see in plastic, this is a little bit lower than you see given the interannual variation in things like um, ingestion from lavage birds, which we'll talk about in a moment. So boluses can be great, low effort, high power, and are relatively reflective of what we're seeing elsewhere in the colony. Now think about long-term studies. Uh, as I think Rob Thomas said a number of years ago, the worst thing you can do is start one. The second worst thing you can do is end one. Um, well, we've fallen foul of the first one already. Um, so we've been monitoring plastics in, in these birds since 2010. And when you're doing a long-term study, you go out for one season and you get a result. And your question is always, well, is this actually what happens in this system? How variable is it? What matters? So this is uh, looking at wing cord along the x-axis and plastic mass along the y in different years. And if we'd just gone out in 2010, we would have thought, oh, more plastic means bigger birds. That's a bit of a puzzler. Uh, and then you go out in, in 2011, you think, oh, actually, more plastic means shorter wings, which makes a bit more intuitive sense, but now, you know, which one of these is actually, is actually right? Um, and it turns out it's incredibly variable, as with just about everything in biological systems. Now, one of the ways that we, that, that we get plastic samples is, is from lavage or, or roadkill birds. Um, so Lord Howe Island has a human population of about 300 uh, with another 300 tourists, and there are roads that go right through the middle of some of the bird colonies. Um, and unfortunately, once in a while, uh, we'll find birds uh, that have fledged. They get attracted to sort of the short street lights so that they're getting better at turning them off now, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, with 20,000 pairs on the island, you're going to get one or two every year. And we can, uh, we can dissect those. And we see we get about nine pieces of plastic in, in those birds. 
Whereas if you go on the morning in the morning and go to the beach, you see the birds that tried to fledge the night before, they get washed back in because they're sick, weak, emaciated, and you see much higher quantities of plastic. And so, you know, looking at monitoring studies, so for example, the Fulmar stuff in the North Sea is all beach wash birds. What does that mean for populations? Can we extrapolate what that means for some of the Fulmars breeding elsewhere in the North Sea? So ultimately, the source of your samples uh, has, and the year in which you collect them, can have a real impact on the conclusions that you might be drawing. And this is the same sort of power analysis. And you can see if you're looking at frequency of occurrence, which is just how many birds have plastic in them, yes or no, you don't need that many uh, to be able to detect a lot of change. But when you start getting up to the number of pieces and the mass of plastic, you know, gosh, you need a lot of birds in order to detect relatively small changes. There is a lot of stochasticity in the system. We don't yet understand why flesh-footed shearwaters eat plastic in the quantities that they do. We don't understand why the uh, sympatric wedge-tailed shearwaters, which feed in a rote the same area, breed at about the same time of year, have hardly any plastic in them at all. We don't understand why if you give a chicken a bit of plastic, a one-day-old chick, within two days it will recognize it is not food. And these birds live to be 35, 40 years old. What is it about them? that means they're eating plastic. We genuinely have no idea. And it's just incredibly variable. Um, and you can see some of the variation here. So for example, 2012, huge amount of plastic in some of the necropsy birds that we found. That was the year we had our record holder, uh, 276 pieces weighing about 64 grams. Now in a shear water, that's about 10% of body mass. So think about what you might weigh. Think about what 10% of that is. Think about having that turning around in your stomach. And then think about running a marathon. You know, that's the flight that these birds are going to take from Australia up to the Sea of Japan. And of course, with birds that have plastic in them, they've got the potential to bring that back to the colony. Every piece of plastic that we touch from these birds has actually gone in and out of a bird at least three times. The parents go out to sea, pick it up, bring it back, regurgitate it, and the chick ingests it. That's three opportunities for harm. And some of the chicks die, some of the parents die, some of the chicks regurgitate boluses. And we can go out into the colony on Lord Howe Island, we can look at actually how many bits of plastic are deposited, brought from sea back to land. And this is some amazing work by Megan Grand, who's a PhD student of ours, um, that basically found birds on Lord Howe Island are bringing back 688,000 pieces, weighing about 16 kilos every year. Uh, which is about 30 pieces of breeding pair. And that sort of tracks what we're seeing uh, in some of the chicks uh, that we're lavaging. It's an interesting way. You know, we think about seabirders as transporters of these marine-derived nutrients, typically, but they're also bringing other things back from the ocean to the colonies. So... Talking about plastics. It's a hot button issue. Everyone loves plastics. Um, which is, I've got to say, an incredible thing to be experiencing having worked in this area for the last decade and a half. I remember sitting at a conservation meeting uh, a few years ago with some of the, the great and the good of marine conservation in the UK and being told, why are you wasting your time studying plastics? It's not causing a population level effect. We should be focusing on invasive species, bycatch and fisheries, uh, and habitat loss. Don't waste your time. And I'm pleased to see that that has changed, especially in the last five years. And how do you get there? Well, scientific papers only do so much, as we all know. Those of you who are at the ECR workshop cover this as well. And so at Adrift Lab, we've been trying to think of ways that we can engage with new and diverse audiences to talk about the issue of plastic. So some of our work, we've been fortunate enough, has appeared in, in government reports, such as the Government Office for Science report, um, Foresight, Future of the Seas, uh, which was in 2018. So that's the feeding up bit to policy, who, the, those who make decisions. But there's also the filtering down. 
to communities um, and the people that might not interact with a lot of the work that we do here. So a couple of great examples. This is Mandy Barker. Mandy is an amazing artistic photographer. And she's been with us in the field twice, uh, once on Lord Howe and once on Henderson Island in the Pitcairn Group of the South Pacific. And this is a camera that Mandy has built out of plastic, beach, trash. And she goes out and she takes pictures in the field. She takes objects from uh, field sites, brings them back to her studio in Leeds, and creates the most amazing artwork that has been featured um, in the UN, in the London Design Biennale, and is exhibited in galleries across the world. Uh, she's got at least three photographic books out as well, featuring um, pieces such as this one, which is called Barcode. Um, this is a turtle that was found on Henderson Island. And you think about you know, sea turtles floating around in the ocean, much like you might see here, but actually uh, this one made entirely of plastics. Um, we engage with writers. Um, Cameron Muir is an amazing uh, environmental writer based in Canberra. He came out with us uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, as you can see there, we're in the colony lavaging some of the birds and wrote the most amazing article talking about uh, the work that we do, but also the challenges that we have doing it. So on Lord Howe, we go out for about two weeks, and it is pretty brutal, if I'm completely honest. You know, we're literally hauling out identifiable pieces of rubbish from birds for two weeks. Um, and that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and Cameron wrote about that incredibly eloquently in, in his piece there in the Griffith Review, which you can read at his, at his website there as well. Um, and film. We've been really fortunate. I'm not sure if our friend from the BBC is still here. Or is he? There he is. Um, we've been fortunate enough to do uh, a number of film projects, uh, including with BBC. We had Liz Bonin out a number of years ago for Drowning in Plastic. Um, which I think reached five million in the UK in the first week. Um, a documentary called uh, Plastic Ocean, which featured one of, uh, we were featured as one of the stories there. Um, and we just recently wrapped up uh, field filming for another documentary um, by the Plastic Ocean crew, uh, this most recent field season. So you can see there we've got um, PhD student Alex de Jersey and, uh, and Cam Batten, who's the cameraman. Uh, looking at one of the birds that we've just dissected out, and you can see the plastic there on the, on the paper towel. And these are audiences that we would have never been able to reach just by publishing papers um, or talking at universities or scientific conferences. Um, and a lot of that has, uh, has generated some great feedback, some of it not so great, um, but I think still important to do. Um, and now I'm going to talk quickly about about St. Nicholas Church. It was quite interesting yesterday when we were looking at the EDI survey results, you know, the comment that uh, I think it was about 16% of folks recognized uh, as a religion. And there was an audible chuckle through the audience. And I was thinking about that last night. And that really, um, that was a bit disappointing, if I'm completely honest. I'm not going to stand up here and be an apologist for the church in any variety or any way. But if we're talking about EDI and making folks feel inclusive, and a sense of belonging, we've got to recognize that those folks exist amongst us here. And I say that as an atheist. And so when I was approached by St. Nicholas Church, which is the seventh oldest church in England, founded in 879, uh, serving Leicester's queer community of faith to be their ornithologist in residence, something we started ultimately as a bit of a laugh, it's proven to be one of the most amazing experiences in my professional life. And I say that not from a faith perspective, but from a community perspective. You know, this is a group of folks that have felt often abandoned, not necessarily having a place to call their own, coming together to build and support uh, a community that works for them. Uh, and so about every three or four months, I'll go up to St. Nick's, I'll give a talk. I've talked about plastics, I've talked about birds, I've talked about the environment, I've given slideshows about our work on Lord Howe Island. And it's amazing to see, just in the sort of 18 months that that's been in place, 
the change, the, the way that folks are thinking about not just their own, you know, where they are, but St. Nick's as a community. You know, smack dab in the middle of the Ring Road in Leicester. Um, and when you think about a church that's been around since 879, you know, this is a place that's exist, existed longer with dodos than without. That's pretty profound. You know, and that's the community that, um, or that's the place where these folks go to uh, for their community. And so we talk a lot about um, things like, you know, what has, what has changed over the last millennium? What has St. Nick seen? What has changed? You know, th we think in relatively short time periods, you know, extinctions. Great Auk was 160, 80 years ago, 1844. Um, you know, that's just, that's, that's just yesterday for a place like this. And that's really, really interesting. And it forms the basis for conversations about the natural environment, what we're doing to it, how we can fix it, um, in ways that have been uh, incredibly rewarding. And the, one of the ways that we, that we do this is by adopting a more queer science perspective. Um, this is a great website. It's the Queer Science Manifesto, written by uh, Brian, Carolyn, and Erinma, which is basically a way of doing science through uh, sort of more a queer epistemology, a queer way of doing things. And you might think, well, how can you, like, honestly, it's a rainbow. How can that affect the science that you're doing? Um, welcome to the second half of the talk. So queer science is all-inclusive, angry, political, filled with unapologetic agendas. The idea that science is this passive, objective thing and we just do our science and then shout it out into the world, um, I think we're increasingly recognizing is not the most effective means uh, to get things done. We don't just go to the moon, but we insist that any people with any kinds of bodies can dream of being astronauts and we pay to make it happen. We put our money where our mouth is. We think about institutions in which we work and their wonderful EDI statements. And when you come down to it, it's just a statement. You know, it's the actions that actually matter. And queer science stops science from being for the plight and only for the, the good kids. It makes science radical uh, and, and interrupting. And I really love this quote. Peter Coles gave a talk at the LGBTQ seminar, which is a one-day science event for queer folks in STEM um, at the Institute of Physics in 2019. He says, some straight people have said to me, now that we have equal marriage, this is in, in the UK context, then it's basically all done, isn't it? It's now no discrimination. You can just stop talking about being, L you stop talking about LGBT plus matters and just be a scientist. That, I'm afraid, is bollocks. <laughs> this is from 1986, and I put this up here um, to demonstrate the fact that this is within the lifetimes of a great number of us here in the audience. The thing about being a queer scientist is, you know, we all know what the pressures are for being a scientist. Funding, job insecurity, moving around a lot, you know, potentially long hours, institutions that make things really awful from finding a desk to making a, you know, booking a plane to doing everything. And then you take all of the, you take all of that and you add this other layer on top of the societal challenges of being LGBTQ+. So that's 1986. I was three years old. Uh, and that was in the UK. Oh, yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. That's 30-odd 30, 30, 30 years ago. This is the UK's current Attorney General, Suella Braverman, who gave a talk at the Policy Exchange two weeks ago. There is a serious risk that the fight for rights undermines democracy. This is the, this is the person who is in charge, the, the, the lead legal expert in the British government. She goes on to say, in my view, primary school, whether they're teaching eight or nine-year-old pupils, year four children, keywords such as transgender or queer, would be falling foul of government guidance. 
nor is it age appropriate to teach four-year-olds that people can change sex or gender. This is the current climate in which we find ourselves. Um, this is a post, this is actually from 2019. This is um, Panty Bliss, who if you don't know, is an amazing uh, Dublin drag queen, has a fantastic YouTube video called Little Things. I do recommend you watch. Um, and this is a brick thrown through um, the, the gay bar in Dublin with the translation, 2019. Uh, and this is Rainbow Project up in Belfast who had their offices broken into and essentially trashed, again, in, in 2019, for no other reason other than they served to support the queer community. So, this is the disturbing bit. So queer folks have higher incidence of poor mental health. Yes, hello? Depression, anxiety, wonderful things. Uh, a greater likelihood of experiencing homelessness, especially young LGBTQ plus folks. We have a lower lifetime earning, which is often referred to as the pink tax. Uh, and we're less likely to have family support in terms of finances or housing. Uh, and just last year, almost half of queer youth considered suicide. That's pretty sobering. And if that existed amongst other demographics, I think we would be possibly a little bit more proactive. Right, quiz time. Take out your pens and paper. I said it was going to be interactive. Now, I promise I'm not going to embarrass anybody. You don't have to share your answers. I'm not going to make you stand up or raise your hand. But I want you to write down on your piece of paper the answer to this question. I'll give you about 20 seconds. Should have the countdown or the Jeopardy music going on in the background, but I was not that prepared, I'm afraid. So keep in mind, this isn't same-sex marriage. This is just literally the legality of same-sex acts. And I should clarify that this is between consenting adults in private. Okay. So we'll start with the first one. 1967 in England and Wales. Not that long ago, 55 years. Uh, next up, we've got Scotland, 1981. Getting closer. Uh, if there's anyone here from Northern Ireland, you were the next year, 82. And 1993 in, in Ireland. And I tailor this slide depending on when I'm giving the talk. And often, as, as Olivia said, I've got an appointment at the University of Tasmania. 1997. 1997. Good grief. This is the environment in which we find ourselves. Um, I was a profoundly uncool child. <laughs> growing up in Eastern Canada in, in the 80s. Um, and, uh, yeah, the glasses are, just don't do a thing, do they, really? Um, and people often ask, you know, how, how did you get to be where you, where you are today? And I get that um, a, a reasonable amount. And I genuinely don't have the answer other than just sort of bumbling along. Um, but in, in Canada, so we legalized same-sex acts in 1969. We had equal marriage in 2005 across the country. Um, this is Elsie Wayne. Uh, she was a Canadian member of Parliament uh, for, gosh, more than a decade in, in the 1990s, former mayor of St. John, New Brunswick, and uh, a very close family friend of my grandparents. And she's there standing up in the Canadian House of Commons. Uh, and probably the most vocal opponent of equal marriage uh, in Canada. And uh, back 
back, back then, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have internet. Uh, you got your doom scrolling from the local op-ed section of your newspaper. And mine was the Telegraph Journal, which asked on the 21st of June, why do you oppose gay marriage? And these are the answers from, from three of the respondents. It violates and discriminates a right against the right of the straight community. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it denies every child in Canada the right to a father, mother, parenthood, because we all know that is absolutely essential. Um, the sight of two men kissing and talking about sex is repulsive to me. So I should, that's all we do, really? We just kiss and talk about sex all the time. Um, yeah, I just can't help it. Oh, I'm so, you know, this, this is the sort of attitude. And this is what we saw repeated in, in the UK in 2014 when we legalized marriage and the incredibly divisive and, um, in my opinion, unnecessary vote in Ireland just a few years later. Um, now we have Twitter. Uh, so I posted this as uh, part of Museum Selfie Day with two of the most colorful birds I could find in the collection. Uh, a classic, sexualized ornithology, zero decorum. Um, for those interested, my course in sexualized ornithology will be offered in the winter term. Uh, Sign-up sheets will be available at registration. Um, and I think everything is sort of epitomized by this really silly cartoon. You, see, you must hide your genitals. You know, wear clothing. By but you can only wear clothing that represents what your genitals are. So whenever somebody sees you, they will think about your genitals. <laughs> when you think about it this way, it's incredibly funny and ridiculous. But actually, this is what queer folks are going through. So just like plastics, here's the link. Just like plastics, it's a lot of the little things. I've been married for about 12 years to my husband, and uh, I still get asked, what does my wife do? We check in in a hotel, and more than on one occasion, we've been said, oh, actually, oh, I'm so sorry. We've now put you in a room with two single beds. And you think about the broader cultural landscape. Think about song lyrics. How many song lyrics sing about love and, you know, and, and, and you know, relationships? And how many of those are about same-sex couples? And when they are, you notice it, because it's different and weird and wonderful. And we think about things like, is it safe to hold hands? Regularly watching the crowd and plotting an escape in a new environment. And like the plastics, each on their own isn't fatal, but they can still hurt. Here's the big stuff. So this is the EU Fundamental Rights Agency report from 2020. Respondents who often or always avoid holding hands in public for fear of assault, threat, or harassment. UK at about ooh, 58%, Ireland uh, just about the same. Now, if you're straight, how many times have you thought about that? Respondents who said they experienced harassment for any reason the last 12 months, 62% in the UK, about 57 in, in Ireland. These are LGBTQ plus respondents. The British Social Attitude Survey is something that's done, I think, by the University of Sussex. Every few years, they ask a bunch of social questions going back to 1983. And this is the response to the question, sexual relations between two adults of the same sex are not wrong at all. And you see, in the 80s, it was pretty abysmal. Uh, and we see equal, finally equal age of consent at 16 in 2001. Uh, civil partnerships, and we're sort of creeping up to the 50% mark. And then it was only when we had same-sex marriage in 2014 in the UK that we saw that breach 50%. You might think, oh, this is brilliant. It's great. It's fantastic. The problem with population-level responses, and many of us will know this from our seabird work, is that it masks individual variation. There's 30% of people in Britain that think my relationship is wrong. And in the context of seabird work, we often do a lot of traveling. And one of the things that I've noticed in, in being out now for almost 20 years is that folks don't necessarily think about the travel aspect of it. This is a map from ILGA, but laws around uh, same-sex, even just acts between consenting adults. Um, it's punishable by death in between 6 and 11 countries. Uh, and in about 70, it's actually still illegal. So when we think in our organizations where we do field work, where we hold conferences, where we take field courses, where we have a duty of care for somebody, how does that interact with this map? 
When we look at the LGBTQ plus STEM blog, which hosts interviews with queer scientists from around the world, we get about, well, we've had about 200,000 views, and 1% of those are from countries where being queer is illegal. And that says something quite profound, I think. This is one example of a message that we receive. Or, put a bit more succinctly, Because when it comes to EDI work, it's not the population level response, like we saw yesterday with those Likert graphs. It's the individual that matters. I can say that both of these individuals are now no longer where they are, and they are indeed safe. Um, this quote from, from Ali Al-Aswani, the Egyptian author, um, I think just pretty much sum, sums it up. You realize that you must live in a, with injustice as a queer person. Uh, and injustice is a terrible thing to live with. And it will not be solved in my lifetimes, in any of our lifetimes. And we've got to grapple with that. So what does the future have in store? And I can be talking about queer stuff, plastic stuff, both. Things are indeed getting better. More people are talking about plastic pollution. We've got more legislation. We're having the first uh, intergovernmental negotiating team talking about a global plastics treaty convening later this year. We're having EDI sessions in scientific conferences as part of the regular program. And there will be lags, dips, and steps backwards. And I think societally, certainly in the UK, I'm less familiar with what's going on in Ireland, uh, we're in a bit of a backward step at the moment. But not only is it important to call out the bad, but it's important to build the good. Um, because ultimately, it's a lot easier when you have a group of folks helping you out. Um, and challenges remain. This is from, from Rainbow Europe, which is a 2002 report. Um, this one particularly struck me. In the UK in 2021, there was one, in the mainstream papers, one anti-trans article every day of the year. Now, that might, might, might not mean a lot to us here today. When we saw the results of the survey yesterday, nobody was comfortable openly identifying as trans in the Seabird community. But things like uh, banning conversion therapy, which is the debunked idea that one can change one's gender identity or sexual orientation uh, through often rather terrible means. So, given the results of the EDI survey yesterday, I'm going to assume that most of you in this audience might consider yourself as, as allies if you're not part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, my first thing to say is that I, I don't think allies exist. Allyship is a transient state. It's not a permanent feature. You don't wash the dishes once in 1993 and say, I'm never washing dishes again because I've washed the dishes. You keep accumulating dishes. It shouldn't be self-ascribed. It should be based on the actions rather than your words or your ideals. And what we need really are co-conspirators. We don't need cheerleaders. What we need is folks who've got skin in the game, who don't mind getting dirty, bloody, when the times get tough. And you know, people say, well, what, what, what do you want out of all of this? Really, I want object permanence, which is the cognitive idea that when something is not in the room, you know it still exists. We know there's coffee out there. None of us can see it, but we know it's going to be there. That's object permanence. And when we're thinking about queer folks or doing anything involving people, we're not, if we're not in the room, we're often not considered. Um, there's a link, the talk's recorded, so you don't have to jot down the link, take a photo, a few resources that I've put up about um, some sort of essential viewing and reading uh, for some, uh, if you happen to be a straight friend or colleague. So as seabirders, what can we do? Well, first of all, we've got to look who's at the table. Now, I think we had a pretty good idea of what that looked like yesterday. And look who's not at the table and why that is. We've got to be aware of survivorship bias. So the fact that I made it doesn't necessarily mean 
that what I did is guaranteeing success for everyone. Where do queer folks get filtered out? Is it secondary school? Is it undergrad? Is it the fact that you know, we're going to field work in remote places with small teams? I was reflecting this morning, I have been in the field for 18 years with probably 100 plus people. I know one other LGBTQ plus person that I've been in the field with. That kind of sucks. And why is that? Is it safety? Is it the location? Is it the workplace culture? Is it the role models? As I said, it's the population level that we often focus on, the percentage of people who said they strongly agree. But it's the individual responses and experiences that matter. Right, so seabirder organizations are quite well represented here. So here are the questions that you can take back to your organization if you can't answer yourself. What mental health provisions, provisions do you have, especially when you're in the field? How are queer staff included in risk assessments, including in duty of care? If you supervise a team and they're going to some place where literally being queer is illegal, can you get them out in 24 hours? Well, I give this talk at universities who run field courses. That's where the penny drops because they realize, oh, crap, no, we can't. People for whom you are responsible as line managers, as instructors, if they can't get, if you cannot get them out, they should not be there. Or indeed, you should not be there. Uh, conservation organizations, I'm looking at you. Uh, as the awkward chuckle emanates through the audience. Um, Short-term contracts and, and low pay. Um, often in really, you know, relatively small places. You think about, certainly in, in the UK, think about where the major conservation organizations are based. They're in relatively small communities, which probably don't have a lot of other queer people around. How serious do we really take bullying and harassment? And I don't just mean on paper, I mean actually putting it into action. Listen, when queer folks say, you should do something. Um, and much like long-term studies, um, the best time for you to fix something may have been in the past, but the second best time to do it is now. So a couple of resources. Um, talk to other queer seabirders. Hello. Um, there are some professional organizations, OSTEM, which is more international, L LGBTQ plus STEM, which I help run, Pride in STEM in the UK, House of STEM in Ireland. Um, and I've got some Irish particular resources here. Um, since we are indeed in Ireland, but similar organizations exist in many countries. And so to end on a slightly positive note, whether it's plastics or diversity, you know, I get asked, do you have hope? Well, there's a, three different kinds of hope. There's ordinary hope, hope that something will be better, but you can't really influence it. You know, I hope it's not going to rain tomorrow, but I have no agency to, to drive that. There's active hope, which is a term coined by Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone in the US, which is becoming active participants in bringing about what we hope for. And this is the one that's really important, because it's making your corner of the world a little bit better. It can be really overwhelming talking about plastic pollution, the fact that we're dumping literally millions of tons of plastic into the ocean every day, producing 350 million tons of it every year. It can be the same with, with EDI. It can seem like an uphill battle, a Sisyphean task. You can't fix it all but you can fix the things that are in your little sphere of influence. And doing something for one other person is enough. That individual level response will matter. And lastly, there's faith in humanity. That if we act with compassion, kindness, and generosity in all that we do, joy in either experiencing or undertaking creative expression, which we do in our work, um, and experiencing the best quality of human beings. So even if you, if you have no you know, ordinary hope, or if you feel that's outside of your grasp, hopefully you'll have one of the other two. So I'll end with, with this fantastic quote. This is Harvey Milk, who was the first out LGBTQ plus person elected to public office in the US. He was uh, elected to the local council in San Francisco. And in 1978, 
He said, and you hear the young people who are coming out, and here Anita Bryant was a very notorious at the time homophobe in the U.S., on television in her story, the only thing they have to look forward to is hope, and you have to give them hope. Hope for a better world, hope for a better tomorrow, a better place to come to if the pressures at home are too great. Hope that they will be all right, because without hope, they will give up. And though seabirds we often think of as, as very black and white, like seabirders, they come in all colors of the rainbow. Sometimes you just have to look for it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, that was horrifying, but also encouraging that we're talking about it, and yesterday as well. So, thanks for that amazing talk. Uh, has anyone got any questions for Alex? Um, I will say, if there are questions that you want to ask that you don't want to ask in public, I'll be around at coffee and, and the rest of the day as well. So, yeah, don't be afraid to come up and grab me. Um, one of the, that was a very fantastic talk, so thank you very much for that. Um, one of, you mentioned early on in the beginning that you had been looking at heavy metals at a point and you were thinking that they probably came from the additives in plastics. Um, is there, what did you find with that and are there any like good resources that kind of point to proving heavy metals in birds do come from plastics? Because I've tried to find that and wasn't able to find a whole lot of literature on it even though Anyway, sorry, I'll let you answer. <laughs> yeah, no, really great question. You know, how do you partition contamination based on sources? And you, know, you can do it for some of the polybrominated compounds because they've got congeners that are only found in plastics and not in fish. So I think you know, PBDEs in particular, they've looked at in short-tailed shearwaters. Metals, no one has done it. Um, it would be quite tricky to do. I think you could probably get around doing it with some of the heavier isotopes of mercury and lead. Um, so if anyone wants a free project idea, there you go. Yeah. That would be amazing for someone to do that. But at the moment, so our, we were reduced to you know, essentially correlations and, and theorizing. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to the next. Can, can people ask Alex questions in the break? And, yeah, thank you again, Alex. That was great. Next we have uh, Céline Albert uh, talking about um, ecotoxicology um, in winter, over winter. Hi, so maybe just before uh, presenting my presentation, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. So we are several of us here from the World Seabird Union and the Twitter conference. So there is Sophie Bennett and Kirsty. I don't know if they are here and they can maybe show. There is one here and Sophie, I don't know if she's, where is she? There, thank you. So if some of you are interested and mostly for the young researchers uh, and that are not in Twitter yet, um, please consider joining us on Twitter. Uh, first because for uh, network and getting visibility, it's really nice. Uh, the Twitter conference uh, has happened for eight years now, and we are looking for new volunteers for next year helping us. So if you are interested, just come and speak with one of the three of us. Um, so the presentation I'm, I'm going to make today is about a work I started at the end of my PhD that I did in La Rochelle University in collaboration with the Norwegian Institute for Natural Research and the Norwegian Polar Institute. So over the last few years, I specialized in non-breeding distribution for seabirds mostly uh, breeding in the Arctic. And during my PhD, I worked on spatial ecotoxicology, meaning trying to understand where the birds were going during the winter period and where they were getting contaminated with mercury. But at some point, I got this opportunity to work on this side project about carryover effects, so still looking at where the birds were going during winter, 
how they were getting contaminated with mercury and what were the potential effects on the following breeding season. So first, maybe just a little bit of uh, background because um, mercury is a natural element, but because of our activities, it has been increasing in our environment. And the most infamous example about mercury toxicity happened in Japan in the Minamata Bay. So in 1932, a petrochemical industry released mercury in the Bay of Minamata. It took around 30 years for the Japanese government to recognize mercury toxicity because they found fish dead in the, in the, in the bay, then cats, and then human, and then there was this neurological disease uh, in, in human. But then it took another around 40 years for having an international program uh, working on mercury. So the United Nations Environment Program initiated a global project for mercury. But it's only in 2017 that the Minamata Convention uh, entered into force uh, with the idea for the signatory country to uh, reduce their emission uh, of mercury in the environment to protect the environment and the earth. Maybe just to give you an idea of the measurements of mercury in human, we see the first deleterious effects of mercury at six micrograms per gram. For the Minamata disease, the concentrations were above 100 micrograms per gram. In birds, it's tissues dependent. We see the first deleterious effects on reproductions for birds at 5 micrograms per gram. In blood, it's, we, it, we, it is at 1 microgram per gram. So mercury is a neurotoxic, it's a reprotoxic, it can affect the number of eggs that are laid, that uh, hatch, uh, the volume of the eggs, it can also affect the behavior of the adults. One of the many issues also of mercury is that it's really highly mobile. So even if there are almost no emissions in the Arctic, everything that we emit here in the mid-northern latitude is transported there through atmospheric currents, oceanic currents, rivers, but also because of everything that is deposited in the Arctic is now released by the ice melting and glacier melting. And it's also pollutant that has the ability to bioaccumulate and biomagnify, meaning that the concentration within the organisms will increase and the concentration within uh, in the trophic chain will increase too. So seabirds uh, at the top of the food chains will have some of the highest concentrations of their environments. So mercury is studied at the international scale. Here is a map from UNEP uh, that was made in 2018, summarizing all of the information we have about mercury contamination in biota, so with the lowest concentration in green and the highest in red. But for instance, what you can see here is that in marine environments, we don't really have any more information about contamination with mercury uh, in biota. In the Arctic, it's the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program who summarize all of the available information. Here is a map, um, a map of the risks that we can see in uh, seabirds measured in blood. And for instance, you see that the birds uh, breeding in Alaska are those with the higher risk compared to other regions. But when you measure mercury in blood, it represents the breeding period. So, because it's, for obvious reasons, it's, it's the moment where we can go on the field and sample the birds. So when they are at sea, it's much more complicated to understand what happens during this non-breeding period. And that's what we have been focusing on during my uh, PhD. Uh, so I worked under a network that is called ARTOX, that was created and is still animated by Jérôme Faure in La Rochelle University we've decided to map mercury contamination at the Pan-Arctic scale. In this study, we used two different tissues to understand, to have an idea of the contamination during breeding and non-breeding period. And we found uh, that in oaks, the concentrations during winter were higher than during summer. And we also found some spatial variation. The birds from the Barents Sea, for instance, had lower concentration in winter than those from the Canadian coast. We also collaborated, and still we are still collaborating with CITRAC. Uh, you will have a presentation tomorrow by Borger, um, which is a Norwegian program we, which aims at tracking uh, non-breeding distribution of seabirds. So we mixed the data from the tracking, 
for the birds with our feathers that represent the non-breeding period to understand what happens during winter or when the seabirds are at sea. And not everything is published uh, yet, but we have this map of contamination showing that the concentration are higher on uh, the west part of the, the Atlantic compared to the eastern parts. And so now that we start to have a better idea of what happens during this non-breeding period when the seabirds are at sea, we wanted to see how if this non-breeding period was affecting the reproduction of seabirds. Um, and to do that, we uh, studied a population of uh, great skua breeding in uh, Bjornoya. Um, several reasons. One is that, for instance, Bjornoya is what we call a sink for pollutants. So, for instance, for persistent organic pollutants, they measured high concentrations uh, there. But also the real, one other reason is that we know that this population splits during winter. One part of the population will spend the winter in the West Atlantic, one of the other in Europe, and one other in Africa. And the previous colleague, they uh, studied persistent organic pollutants measured in blood. So as I mentioned, blood represents the, mostly the breeding period. But even when measuring pups in blood, they found an influence of the winter distribution on this contamination, with lower contam contamination for seabirds wintering in Africa compared to those wintering in the West Atlantic or Europe. And they also found um, that males were more contaminated than uh, females. So for our study, we used feathers, and the reason you can use feathers is because mercury is excreted into the feathers at every molt. So the mercury you measure in your feather will represent the intermolt uh, periods. And for those QR, it's around the, 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 the uh, year. Um, and we mixed that with the tracking information. And we followed birds for three years, so we had 27 individuals and 30 measurements because birds were caught several times. And what we found, and please, uh, it's a paper that is under review, so please don't put the results on Twitter. Um, what we found is that we um, have higher concentration of the, for the birds wintering uh, on, on the European parts than those wintering on the West Atlantic and the lowest concentration for the birds wintering uh, in Africa. And as I mentioned, this five microgram per gram for the feathers, uh, for the toxicity risk, when we use this threshold, it's 81% of our measured birds that were above this toxicity risk. And as, of, as the colleague uh, found that uh, male were more contaminated than female, we wanted to check that. Uh, and actually in our case, it's the female that are more common, contaminated than the male. So of course we can wonder if it's an effect of the diet, because mercury contamination mostly comes from the diet. Uh, but we actually don't know because we don't know what the skua eats during uh, winter and we can't use isotopes to study that because mercury in feathers represent this intermolt period but when you use isotopes in the feathers it represents only the period where the feather is grown which means that there is a mismatch and it's a bit tricky to use both at the same time. Uh, but we made maybe the assumption that there is maybe a size effect because the female are actually bigger than, uh, than the male. So maybe they accumulate more contaminants than the male. So um, as I mentioned, mercury can have effects on the number of, a of eggs that are laid, hatched, or the egg volume. So we looked at those three variables. Uh, in skuas, they can have one or two, egg, uh, two eggs per year. For the numbers of eggs laid, we found a trend showing that uh, actually the n highest number of eggs laid was for the bird wintering in the West Atlantic, so one of the more contaminated areas. But for the egg hatched, it was in Europe where they are the most contaminated that we found the, lower, uh, hatching, uh, the, lowest, the lowest hatching success. But in both cases, even if we saw a trend, the um, uh, result of the, st the test was not significant. And then we, use, we looked at the egg uh, volume. So what we saw here is that um, the egg volume was decreasing uh, with an increasing contamination with mercury for the birds wintering in Africa or in the West Atlantic. But for birds wintering in Europe, where we have the highest concentration, the trend is slightly actually in, increasing. 
So we just wanted to check maybe at the female body mass because we saw that the body mass of our female was different depending on where they were wintering, but it was not, uh, according to our test, it was not um, affecting the egg uh, volume. So we made the assumption that maybe there is a direct effect of the contamination of the female on the volume of the eggs. This trend uh, of the, um, the egg volume decreasing with mercury contamination was previously shown in a little oak uh, population breeding on the east uh, coast, uh, east coast of, of uh, Greenland, where they also saw that the size of the eggs was decreasing with mercury contamination. So just to sum up uh, here those results, so we have spatial differences in mercury contamination that can potentially have uh, different carryover effects depending of where our birds are spending winter. And it's going to be a work that we will continue, so not specifically for the population in Bionoya, but we are uh, working on, uh, we have some proposal um, for, for funding at the moment to look at long-term contamination of uh, mercury and the effects on the reproduction and see if there is potentially an effect also on the population dynamics of uh, this uh, species. Because I didn't mention, but uh, for instance, for Bionoya, we had birds that we had to remove from the data set, but with concentration going up to 35 micrograms. So these species have the ability to really have high concentration. So we really need to continue study this, uh, these aspects. So thank you very much. And of course, I want to thank all of the field workers and the founders of, of the project. And if you have any questions, please ask. I promise I am much nicer than the skewers. For those who work with them, they know. <laughs> Thanks very much, Celine. Uh, we have time for a very quick question. Hi, thank you. Um, would you mind just expanding on like a bit more of the bigger picture? What's the knock-on effect of on egg volume? And, like, how does that affect reproduction? What are you interested in? So, when we look at the egg volume, the the, the effect that we can see after that is that a reduced size of the chick and probably an effect on the survival on the chick that is behind. Then we we'll have to move on to Beth Clark now. One there. So is it the best of time or is it the worst of time? I'm not sure. I think it's either neither of them. It's probably the better one, and it could be much worse uh, for the black cap petrol. I would like to thank um, our funders. We have a very limited amount of funding for this species, which breeds in the Caribbean. Um, but any small grant is important and useful, so thank you to especially to the Seaver Group for um, a small grant. So some background about the species. It's a uh, gadfly petrel nesting in the Caribbean. We have um, a few conference sites in uh, Española, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. Some probable and likely sites in Cuba and Dominica, and some suspected sites in other islands. We, the population is estimated at between 1,000 and 5,000 individuals, they're a big range, we, we don't know. Um, we know about subpopulations, we know three for sure, with 120 nests, um, which are known. It's endangered and a decreasing population size. Uh, what's important in this species, and in many peregrine ter petrels, that have their differences in phenotypes, with, in this case, two color forms with intermediates in the middle. Um, there is a light form, which is bigger and heavier, and so to the left and a dark form, which is uh, smaller and, and lighter to the right. The picture on the top right is not great because it looks like the, the bill is much bigger, but um, it's not the case. There are genetic differences. Uh, Manilo looked at uh, COI and, and showed that the light and intermediates are more related to each other than they are to the dark. And uh, recently, in some data that I'm going to present, we highly suspect allochrony in sympathy Sympatry with light and dark nesting in the same areas in, in Hispaniola, but the light nesting earlier, about one and a half months earlier than the dark form. Uh, and that's as a preprint right now uh, in BioArchive. So um, I'm part of the International Black Capital Working Group. We just 
published a conservation uh, action plan. I put some leaflets there if you're interested. I encourage you to, to look, look it up if you're interested too. But I'm, what I'm going to show it's uh, just our research that we're doing on the marine aspect of, of the species. There's a lot of work doing, being done by our colleagues in the Caribbean on a terrestrial part of it. So I'll talk about distribution and uh, threat exposure at sea, mercury, and if I have time about diet as well. In terms of distribution, so all the data we knew, all, all the information we had on distribution was from ship-based survey on, on the left, uh, with a hot spot out of uh, Cape Hatteras, uh, which is where the Gulf Stream comes out. Well, the Gulf Stream comes out of Flo uh, Gulf of Mexico, and then here bends towards the east, and that's where there is a hot spot of, of uh, black cat black cat petrol. Uh, Individual-based trackings show that the birds are mostly using the western North Atlantic for non-breeding. Uh, some of them could be going there during breeding as well, but during chick rearing, we show that they actually, well, we suspect, that's a small sample size, uh, that they could be going to um, a consistent and strong upwelling of the Guajira Peninsula in Colombia and Venezuela. <clears throat> so this study on distribution was first um, came up to try to locate the nesting areas of the light form, which we didn't know at the time. Um, so there was a capture effort in Cape ha of Cape Hatteras at sea in mid-2019. Um, and as for all things petrol, uh, when you don't know what to do, you call the Kiwis. So we um, collaborated with Chris Gaskin of the Northern New Zealand Seabird Trust to catch them at sea. We used Trump and Bay to attract them. Uh, compressed air <coughs> and launcher to capture them, and then, <coughs> sorry, tag them with sutures uh, with PTTs. That was about 2% of body mass. Um, so we caught five dark and, and five, five uh, well, light and intermediate, which we grouped for analysis, following manly at all. Um, we were <coughs> purposely f uh, trying to catch light uh, and dark, so that's why there is a, a good different, a good um, sample of each. Um, the light form were bigger and were also molting, while the dark forms were not. So tracking duration, where well, there is some range, um, average is about 100 days, which is what's common for this type of attachment. And for analysis, um, so use a, a good pinch of salt, uh, because sample size is just seven birds, unfortunately. And all the the grass light is going to be yellow and dark and blue. In terms of distribution, so I uh, resampled and improved the location using uh, the foie gras package. Uh, so this is the distribution, and the, the dark is the um, location of the western wall of the Gulf Stream during the study period. And what's interesting here is that there's actually a difference in distribution between the dark and the light, with the light being, well, I guess the dark being the, or, uh, the historical area that we knew about the black cap petrol using the western wall of the Gulf Stream up to the bend, and the light one being more in those um, eddy areas where the um, Labrador current m mixes uh, with the Gulf Stream. Um, so there is a significant difference there and didn't find any effect of date or individual preferences, but it's a small sample size. Um, so I won't go talk more about this part, but I also looked at uh, exposure to marine threats as a first step to assessing the species' vulnerability. Um, in this case, it's macro exposure with, uh, with 50 and 80 percent UDs. Um, and the landscape of risk. So thank you for my colleagues for talking about mercury, plastics, and fisheries before me. Um, so I use global models of mercury, uh, that's total mercury, microplastics, about the same as what Beth used. Uh, fishery is a global fishing watch. Marine traffic is a, it's important in this case because there is um, a big area of, tra of ship shipping going through, uh, sorry, this is the distribution of the dark form, but going through the, the core area of black eye petrol here. And that's a vector for contaminants, uh, attraction to lighted vessels, uh, any kind of pollutants as well. In terms of energies, um, the red areas are wind energies. A wind farm proposed or, or active. And just here in Canada, that's exploration for oil and gas um, petroleum. What's missing from this is hurricane. Um, linking back to Emily's talk, black cap petrols are 
usually pushed by hurricanes inland, and given the small size of, of the um, population, even tens of birds dying uh, has a big effect. But that's not something we could model. So looking at overlap, re uh, macro scale, the dark, sorry, the dark form is more exposed to mercury, plastic, and marine traffic, uh, given their distribution. The light form is more exposed to fisheries, but that could be a uh, artifact of, of the small sample size. And, bo um, and the lights also occurred within Canadian waters, uh, um, petroleum exploration, and they were both overlapping with wind energy areas uh, in the US. Okay, I'll just go quickly. Uh, so linking to Mercury, so thanks to the Steber Group for uh, a small grant, and we looked at feathers in uh, the black cap petrol. So in this species, some people who had done reviews on mercury um, in pelagic seabirds probably know about it. There is a single preview studies from the 80s, which was which only available as an abstract to a conference, and the abstract is not available anymore. So what we know about it is citation from other papers. So it's very uh, not precise. We know it's 18 ppm in feathers. We don't know which feathers. So it's somewhere um, in this realm of um, concentrations in pterodromas. So we partnered with the USGS Mercury Research Lab in, in the US, uh, use breast feathers. Um, I'm not a mercury person, so I'm, I'm putting the methods there. If you see anything wrong or weird, please talk to me. And what we, we got for those 20 feathers, 20 birds, it's, uh, well, in high levels, about 30 uh, parts per million. And, and feather, and even with the, the minimum being at 15 and going up to 40, 54 uh, ppm. So that puts black cap petrol high as well in the top, top two of uh, pterodroma I could find. Uh, I didn't, we didn't observe an effect of phenotype, so that goes against what the model or what the exposure showed, uh, which showed an exposure, a difference in exposure um, between the light and the dark. Uh, but then the sample size is limited for the light phenotype. But also the model I use is a global model of total, mer total mercury, so that could not be the best uh, for that kind of question. So going back to, um, I guess I have time for fecal DNA analysis that with uh, Gemma Klukas at Cornell. So there again, there was a single previous study from the 90s um, in about this, um, diet. Um, it was from bird that had been collected at sea, so uh, shot. Um, and then squid was the, in terms of frequency of occurrence, the, the more frequent, frequent um, diet item. But squid do accumulate in digestive system, so we, we wanted to um, look more into this. So uh, looking fecal DNA, uh, we had a small sample size again. Uh, and limited amplification, the, the samples, well, had to travel from the Caribbean to the US, and that took a long time, and we lost samples this way. But looking at universal primer, which is the primer where we can look at cephalopoda, uh, squid was, or cephalopoda was only present in two samples. So it's very preliminary, but it might not be as prevalent as we, we thought. And looking at the fish primer, so we got 16 families and uh, well, only 10 species identified. But it showed diversity in, in, the, in the fish um, caught by the species and, and um, eaten by the species with during non breeding, so I'd seen pelagic areas with just limited number of species, one or three, and then it looked like there, there could be more um, diversity in species when they were fishing in that upwelling of Colombia and more coastal areas. It's so Combri formed where about 60% of all sequence reads. And in terms of fish type, um, deep sea and species that perform a dial migration were uh, between 30% and one-fifth of all sequence reads. Um, so there were at least three species that were fished commercially, so they could be interaction with, um, with, with fishing fleets. Uh, we're not sure, we have to look more into this as, as well. So in conclusions, um, well, it appears from, once again, the limited sample size, um, that they have distinct distribution, the light and dark phenotypes. At sea observation by uh, pelagic observers seem to confirm that, although their methodology is not consistent, but um, it's something we, we look into more, uh, which then results in distinct threat exposure in Western North Atlantic. 
high level of total mercury in, in feathers, uh, and in form of pelagic fish, which could explain that high level of total mercury. So next steps, well, you could guess, increase sample size, uh, but also track both forms through the annual cycle, so we really know if uh, that difference we had is just linked to timing or linked to phenotype. Track from other breeding locations once we find them, and a finer spatial temporal scale to relook really at interaction with fisheries, uh, either um, artisanal in the Caribbean or industrial in, in the Western Atlantic, but also interaction with oil and gas platforms in the U.S., in the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean as well. And then, uh, linked to that question of size, assess difference, differences in ecological niches, uh, given, given that the light one is bigger and the dark one is smaller, so they could be targeting different species in different areas. So thank you for um, all the people who helped uh, with this. And once again, thank you for our founders. And uh, the preprint is available on BioArchive Archive. Um, and I'm welcome to give you a PDF if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we again have time for a really brief question from somebody. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, I noticed for the, the light form, there's been quite a few sightings on this side of the Atlantic, maybe up to 18 or 20 now. Um, given that it's a bigger bird, longer wingspan, and the diagram you showed of the distribution was more northerly and extended a little bit into the Atlantic, um, what are your thoughts on the potential distribution and threat exposure? over towards this side of the Atlantic, or the mid-Atlantic? This side of the Atlantic? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. As, as you mentioned, there have been between maybe 15 or so um, vagrants um, coming to this side. We're not sure. One was caught off Cabo Verde, um, and there's hope they could be breeding there. Um, but there, the, the threat exposure um, According to a colleague in Cabo Verde, um, they don't think there's much going on around those islands there for Ternura petrels. It's more on the coast of Africa. Um, and, and further, I guess, in the eastern Atlantic, um, I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about people studying Mengshi waters of other species about that. Does that answer your question, what, that, what you asked? Or? Yeah, and yeah, that's, yeah, I call them vagrants, but they, they may not be vagrants. Uh, we actually had one bird going towards the Mid Atlantic before the tag stopped. Um, we, what may be wrong about our uh, assessment, uh, the population may be much bigger than we expect as well. Um, that's where we don't know because we don't know all the nesting sites uh, in the Caribbean. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're going to have to go for coffee. Um, Thank you. But thanks again for all the speakers this session and see you back here at sometime soon, 11.15. <laughs> <11 .15. laughs>